Spider-Man has been in gaming since the early 1980s and has consistently been featured in games ever since. When Activision began publishing Spider-Man games in 2000, this started to mark a high point, featuring fan favorites like Spider-Man 2 in 2004 and Ultimate Spider-Man in 2005. However, fans felt the quality of Spider-Man games begin to fall, starting with Spider-Man 3 in 2007, continuing on with Spider-Man Friend or Foe and Spider-Man Web of Shadows. Reviews for those games were mixed, leading Activision to pass Spider-Man to a new developer in hopes that they would bring some fresh ideas into their Spider-Man games. This new development studio was Beanox, who at this time were mostly a porting house, helping to port big games to the PC instead of developing their own original games. However, in 2006, they began developing their own games again, starting with titles such as the B-Movie game, Monsters vs. Aliens, and Guitar Hero Smash Hits prior to taking on Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions. If you're wondering how they went from games like B-Movie to then being handed Spider-Man, it was actually their porting experience that landed them the gig, since they had helped to port some of those prior Spider-Man games like Spider-Man 3 and Friend or Foe. Creative director Thomas Wilson recently told GamesRadar that Activision had asked Beanox to rejuvenate the franchise with something that would be new and innovative, so they started brainstorming ideas based on the comic books and not the movies. The game's original concept is also further described in one of the behind-the-scenes videos. We were sitting in my office one day and we were discussing what we could do for the next step in the Spider-Man franchise. At some point we stumbled upon a picture of Spider-Man 2099 and he was like, oh, is that a bad guy? No, no, that's his Spider-Man. We started looking at different versions of Spider-Man and somebody in the team came to us and said, there are a lot of great possibilities out there, I'd like to play them all. And we were like, play them all? That's genius! So that's basically how it started. Back then, the team were excited about the idea of playing as multiple versions of Spider-Man, but weren't sure how to place them together in a story cohesively. So they brought in the Amazing Spider-Man comic series writer Dan Slott to help with the story. Dan Slott would later use this game's story as an inspiration for his own comic series called Spider-Verse, a series where multiple alternate versions of Spider-Man work together against a common threat. This comic series would later serve as inspiration for the Into the Spider-Verse movie, so it's cool that this game inadvertently helped to start such a great series of Spider-Verse stories. There were technically other Spider-Verse-style stories before Shattered Dimensions, such as the 90s animated show's crossover event, but it was Shattered Dimensions that really got the ball rolling into the Spider-Verse that we know today. But let's start to get into what Beanox gave us in this game. Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions released in September 2010 to PS3, Xbox 360, Nintendo Wii, and Nintendo DS. In this video, we'll be focusing on the console editions of the game, specifically the PS3 version. All of the gameplay you'll see throughout this video came from the PS3 version, but emulated on a software called RPCS3, which allowed me to boost the graphics. So with that said, let's see what Beanox and Slot gave us with the story. Hey there, true believers! Watch as once again, frightening forces are at work in our world, ready to wreak havoc with our very existence. Who or what? prowls the halls of Empire State University after dark. None other than the master of illusion himself, the menacing Mysterio. <sighs> the tablet of order and chaos. Selling you on the black market is gonna make me a mint. Good, you can <gasps> use a mint. I can smell your breath from here. Spider-Man? Wait, how would you eat a mint through that fishbowl? Nice! Don't get me wrong, your illusions are nifty and all, but if you ask me, they could use a little more kick! <laughs> nah, -uh. souvenirs are available in the gift shop. Stop it! Cease your incessant prattling! But incessant is the best kind of prattling. Watch this. Hey, Bubblehead, think fast! Whoa, what the heck was that? <laughs> okay, can somebody tell me what's going on here? Spider-Man, you are needed. Madam Web? As if this night wasn't strange enough already. The Tablet of Order and Chaos is the most powerful of all the mystic artifacts in the world. And you shattered it. Yeah, sorry about that. Guess they don't make tablets like they used to, huh? 
The pieces are now fragmented across other dimensions. Dimensions that are strange reflections of our own. A past unlike ours. A present day out of sync. And a distant future which may or may not come to pass. Is that a cartoon pig? Focus. I require your help. Yours and the help of these three other Spider-Men. The heroes into whose realities the tablet fragments fell. Whoa, whoa, slow down. Other realities? Other me's? Yes, I have explained our dire situation to them. They will be your allies in this quest. But I'm the most charming, right? You must gather all the pieces of the tablet before they fall into the wrong hands. Or our reality, as well as theirs, will be utterly destroyed. Yeah, right. No pressure or anything. So as you saw, Spider-Man accidentally shattered the Tablet of Order and Chaos into pieces, causing them to fly off into other dimensions. At this moment, Madam Web pops in. In the comics, Madam Web suffers from paralysis and blindness, which is why she has the blindfold over her eyes and why she's confined to her chair. However, she also has extremely powerful psychic abilities such as clairvoyance and telepathy, which is why she is able to sense the chaos that will ensue from these tablet shards making their way throughout various universes. With this knowledge, she requests the aid of Peter and other versions of Spider-Man to help collect the missing pieces. Behind Madame Web are also glimpses at other various Spider-Men from the comics. And yes, this one is legitimately from the comics. It's a what-if story where Betty Brant became Spider-Man, Betty Brant being the secretary for J. Jonah Jameson at the Daily Bugle. Some of the other ones are Spider-Girl, the daughter of Mary Jane and Peter Parker named Mayday Parker, and this one is Mangaverse Spider-Man, a member of a ninja clan called the Spider-Clan. This character looks to be Ashley Barton Spider-Girl, first appearing in the Old Man Logan comics as the daughter of Hawkeye and the granddaughter of Peter Parker. I'm not so sure about this one though. To me it kind of looks like when Jameson's son becomes Spider-Man in a What If comic, but it's not identical. If you recognize this alternate reality Spider-Man, I'd love to know in the comments below. But after receiving our message from Madame Web, she telepathically guides us to the first few pieces of the fragment in this tutorial level. This level introduces us to the basic elements of combat and traversal for each version of Spider-Man that we'll be playing as throughout the game. First is the classic Spider-Man or Amazing Spider-Man dimension, where we learn how to jump, wall crawl, and use our spider sense. Spider sense is basically detective vision from the Batman Arkham games, highlighting mission-specific objects and hidden items. In this case, a wall of debris that can be pulled to reveal our first fragment. From here, we transition into our next dimension, the Ultimate Universe. However, the Ultimate version of Spider-Man is also equipped with the Symbiote Suit. He's understandably pretty concerned about this, since the Symbiote Suit has negatively influenced him in the past, but Madame Web states that she's using her psychic powers to keep the Symbiote at bay, allowing Peter full control of it. During this level, we also learn how to web zip to different areas of the map, as well as how to web swing. After reclaiming the first shard in the Ultimate Universe, we then transition to the future for Spider-Man 2099. This Spider-Man isn't Peter Parker though, and is instead Miguel O'Hara. In this future universe, there aren't superheroes anymore like there were in the present timeline. That didn't stop evil corporation Alchemex from trying to genetically replicate heroes though, specifically Spider-Man. Miguel was accidentally exposed to one of their Spider-Man tests, which is how he gained his powers. In this level, we learn the basics of combat against the public eye soldiers before claiming our piece of the tablet. This leads us into Spider-Man Noir, a dimension where Peter Parker is Spider-Man in the 1930s. This version of Peter is a lot darker and more serious compared to the other versions in the game. This Peter Parker gained his powers after being bitten by a spider that was housed in a mysterious spider statue. After the bite, Peter has a vision of a spider god who says that he will imbue Peter with the curse of power, after which Peter reawakens with powerful spider abilities. Peter decides to use his power as a way to turn the tide against the man causing so much corruption in this city, Norman Osborn, who we'll discuss more in a bit. In this level, we learn the stealth gameplay that's unique to Spider-Man Noir. This felt reminiscent of Batman Arkham Asylum, where you'll also stalk enemies and perform stealth takedowns. I don't think I was the only one feeling the Batman similarities either, since it was brought up during a couple of developer interviews around the time of its release. This one in particular comes from Game Reactor while interviewing creative director Thomas Wilson. We started working on a game a long time ago, and um, Batman Arkham Asylum took us by surprise. It, to, you know, it came out a little bit of out of nowhere. Um, I was looking at it, um, you know, just looking at screenshots, and then you played a game, and I was like, oh my, you know, there are things that are kind of similar. But... Um, Yes, I mean, there's some similarities, if you will, uh, looking at the stealth aspect of the, the noir dimension, but, so, but that's only a fourth of our game. 
Batman Arkham Asylum released about a year before Shattered Dimensions, so I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt that they were working on similar mechanics to Rocksteady without knowing it at the time, but I'm sure they also took some inspiration from the game after its release as well. However, there is a level later on in the game that makes it very obvious that Beanox was taking ideas from Arkham Asylum and implementing them here. But after taking out all the henchmen at the train station, we reclaim the last tablet fragment for this level. No, Spidey, it's just the beginning. Across many dimensions, these four fearless Spider-Men, in all their various incarnations, must fight to reassemble the tablet of order and chaos. Not just for the sake of their own worlds, but for the fate of every world in every dimension. Good luck, web slingers. We're all counting on you. You've recovered the first quarter of the tablet. Excellent. I've always been good at scavenger hunts. Like moths to a flame, those with evil hearts will be drawn to the unleashed power of the tablet, gaining new and frightening powers. So far, you have been fortunate that none of them have fallen into enemy hands. Why'd you have to go and say that? Man, what a jinx. Ah, useless hunk of nothing. Wait. What's this? Ah, yes. Power. This is what real power feels like. No more parlor tricks and sleight of hand. Mysterio is now the master of real magic. And this is just the beginning. <laughs> That concludes the tutorial section, which brings us into the main game. For our first level, we follow the amazing Spider-Man as he takes on Kraven the Hunter for a fragment. After Spider-Man locates the fragment in this apartment, he's gassed by Kraven and taken to a remote jungle. Kraven has set up a test of skills for Spider-Man to complete and promises the tablet fragment as a reward for beating his gauntlet. We have no choice but to comply, so we pursue Kraven and fight his disciples. By the way, each version of Spider-Man has some sort of unique aspect to him. For Amazing Spider-Man, that's his web combat. His heavy attacks will create web wrecking balls that are incredibly satisfying to use amongst large groups of enemies. As we progress through the story and unlock new abilities, Spider-Man will start to incorporate other shapes into his web attacks like mallets and spiked punches. I think they did a good job with Amazing Spider-Man's combat here, and I think he's one of the most fun to play as. But as we continue through Kraven's gauntlet, we reach a point where Kraven shoots our webbing with a sniper rifle. For this section of the level, we play it from Kraven's perspective as he watches us through his sniper rifle scope. We're still playing as Spider-Man, but we have to anticipate the next sniper shot while defeating enemies. We can't safely use our webs either, so we have to improvise and manipulate Kraven into shooting down a tree, creating a bridge. It's a short section in the level, but I think it's such a creative way to spice up gameplay and keep the player on their toes. But after safely escaping this area, we enter an arena for a cage match. We'll start against one of Kraven's heavies, but after defeating him, Kraven is embarrassed and takes out his own men as punishment. He declares that he'll put on a show for his people, and challenges us to a one-on-one -on -one match. This is our first legitimate boss fight, and Kraven works well as the first boss. He's a quick fighter and tests the skills that we've learned throughout the mission, specifically our spider sense, since we'll have to dodge Kraven's attacks before hitting him, and he'll occasionally trigger spikes in the floor to impale us if we don't dodge out of the way in time. He's a fun fight with multiple layers, my favorite being the first person mode. At a certain point, we'll get up close and personal with the villain and have to brawl our way out. It feels like a boxing match where we have to anticipate incoming attacks and punch when we have an opening. The tutorial box says that you'll be more effective if you vary your punches, but I'm not sure if you actually need to. Regardless, I tried to use a variety of punches against each enemy just for fun. We eventually get the upper hand on Kraven though and knock him outside of the dome. He escapes and we continue our pursuit. Eventually we catch up to him, but he's decided to upgrade his powers with the tablet. With the tablet's powers, Kraven now has enhanced speed, making him much more formidable. His attacks are harder to anticipate and he's better at dodging us now. So we have to trust our spider sense and dodge his flurry of attacks until we have an opening. After a while, we'll wear down Kraven and take him down for good. Excellent, Spider-Man. You've done it! And just in time. If I never hear the word hunt again, it'll be too soon. Now to the other fragments. The hunt resumes. Like with Kraven, each level from here on is based on a specific villain associated with a particular dimension, and you can choose whatever order you'd like to complete them in. For this video, we'll go in order, starting with Spider-Man Noir, facing off against Hammerhead. Night on the waterfront. 
On the docks, rats scurry about their grim business. A tip from Felicia Hardy brought me here. Looks like she was onto something. Whoa, it's slipping! Hey, look at this. It's just a hunk of rock. What's all the extra protection for? The goblin paying you to ask questions now? No, Hammerhead. Then shut up. Goblin says the spider's coming after the tablet, and he wants all measures taken to stop him getting it. I'm flattered. Now load it in before I lose my cool. Oh, you're gonna lose your cool, all right. It's him! The Spider-Man! Then stop gawking and start throwing left! I think we lost him. Keep your eyes peeled. You see something, shoot first and ask questions. Never. We're not taking any chances. Read me? Loud and clear, boss. During that cutscene, they throw in a fun reference to Felicia Hardy, saying that she gave Spider-Man a tip to investigate the docks. In the standard 616 comic universe, Felicia is known as the Black Cat, but in the noir universe, she instead owns a nightclub called the Black Cat. As a club owner, she's in the know about different scandals occurring in the city, and she's given noir Spider-Man intel before, so this reference is a nice touch. Hammerhead also mentions the Goblin, which is Norman Osborn's nickname in this universe, and Osborn basically runs the city through corruption as a criminal mastermind. Hammerhead is one of his goons here, but that wasn't the case in the comics. In a pre-release interview with GameSpot, it's described how Hammerhead was included in the game despite not being in the noir comics. And Hammerhead is a very traditional, iconic Spider-Man villain who does not yet exist in the noir comic series. But when we were brainstorming of which villains we wanted to include in the game, we felt that our designers felt that Hammerhead would be a perfect fit for the noir universe. So we approached Marvel and pitched the idea of creating a Hammerhead exclusive to the game for the noir universe. Marvel was very excited about it and worked closely with us to develop and design the Hammerhead that is in our game. I think this was a good decision because Hammerhead really fits the noir environment. Throughout this level though, we'll be stalking Hammerhead from the shadows and taking out his goons. If you get into the light, it's much easier for enemies to see you and they'll probably catch you, so you have to stay in the darklit areas as much as possible. Spider-Man Noir's Dimension was one of my favorites to visit, since it has some really interesting aspects to it. The takedown animations are exciting and some of them are contextual with the environment, like taking down enemies near a wall. I also really love the atmosphere of this dimension in particular. The 1930s environment mixed with the noir film style feels incredibly thematic. That along with the stealth-based gameplay makes this dimension feel the most unique amongst the four since none of the other Spider-Men have stealth-based mechanics, so I really appreciated these noir levels. As we follow Hammerhead, he eventually gets the drop on us and lures us into a trap where he set up a Gatling gun in a train yard so he can mow us down with ease. If we're ever in the light, Hammerhead will swing the gun around and start blasting at us. We have to maneuver through the dark areas of the map until we can position ourselves behind Hammerhead and take him down. We'll do this a couple times during the fight, at which point he'll escape further into the train yard. When we encounter Hammerhead again, he's embraced the power of the tablet, granting him enhanced abilities. We won't face him just yet though, since he set us up for another trap. He lures us onto the train tracks and sends some of his henchmen to fight us, while trains drive through at top speed. Having a combat section injected into the noir levels helps to break up any tedium you may be feeling with the stealth levels, and noir's combat is pretty enjoyable itself. He's not overly flashy like the other Spider-Men, but he feels like the up-close brawler that you would expect from this era. After taking out all of Hammerhead's henchmen, we confront him for our final showdown. It seems the tablet has powered up his machine guns, allowing him to also shoot rockets at us. Our strategy during this fight is to dodge his machine gun fire until we find an opening to lob a barrel at his head. This will piss him off and cause him to start firing rockets. Our goal is to get him to shoot these generators with the rockets, which will create a smoke screen, providing us with some cover. From here, we'll get above him and perform a takedown. After doing this a few times, we'll run out of generators and Hammerhead will charge at us. If we dodge with a wall behind us, he'll run his head into the wall and get stunned. From here, we box him and take him down. The rest of the levels follow the same format. We'll fight a boss while they are in their normal state, and then we'll fight them again later on while they're powered up with the tablet. So there's not a ton of overarching story during these sections, but we'll still go through the rest of the villains since each level is pretty unique. The next one being Hobgoblin in the 2099 dimension. Hobgoblin is another original creation for the game and not part of the 2099 comics. His origin here is a bit of a mystery, and he was presumably created by the 2099 version of Dr. Octopus to destroy this version of Spider-Man. 
In the character bio, it also mentions rumors that the original Hobgoblin's grave was dug up in order to retrieve the DNA necessary to create this new Hobgoblin. I also found it interesting that it never confirms if someone is actually in the suit. Nevertheless, Spider-Man 2099 now has his own goblin to deal with, and it's gotten its hand on the tablet. Our mission starts with us free-falling from a skyscraper as we attempt to chase down Hobgoblin. The skydiving gameplay is 2099's unique gameplay feature, and we'll see it come up multiple times throughout his levels. It's pretty fun too, as you have to dodge flying cars and debris. You can also boost your diving speed, which can be riskier, but it'll get you to your target faster. If you can get close enough to Goblin, you can grab him and punch him, or run him into the environment. Once we make it to the bottom, we have our first fight against Goblin, who throws pumpkin bombs just like the classic Goblins from the Heroic Age. To beat him, we simply grab the bombs and lob them back at him. Goblin escapes, and we continue our pursuit until we're confronted by the public eye, the security force of the future. Goblin has manipulated them into believing that Spider-Man is their enemy, so we have to take them out too. Spider-Man 2099's combat is a lot more zippy than the other Spider-Men, emphasizing his speed and his attacks. We'll also utilize 2099's unique special ability, which is his accelerated vision. This ability slows down time, but allows Spider-Man to move at a normal speed. This is handy in combat if you're facing challenging enemies, like these ones with rocket launchers, or during these skydiving missions to help you dodge obstacles. I found it to be the most useful during the skydiving sections, but it is really fun luring a rocket into another enemy. As we're pursuing Goblin, we'll also see a lot of easter eggs for other Marvel characters, highlighting the future's obsession with the Heroic Age's superheroes. For example, we'll often see billboards showing characters like Wolverine, Hulk, Black Cat, and Storm. There's also the company Stark Fujikawa, in reference to a 2099 corporation in the comics, run by the character Fujikawa-sama, based in Japan. This company was formed after Stark Industries and Fujikawa Industries merged in the future. But once we finally catch up to Hobgoblin, he's decided to utilize the power of the tablet and enhance his psi powers, allowing him to conjure demonic goblins as his minions. This is another really good boss fight, even though it operates pretty much the same as before. We first have to take out his demonic minions, which causes him to leave his protective barrier, and then we have to dodge his different attacks until he throws more pumpkin bombs at us, at which point we can intercept them and return them back. After doing this a few times, Goblin will attempt to grab us and take us to the skies, but Spider-Man gets the upper hand, causing us to freefall again. We get to punch the Goblin a bunch as we fall towards the ground, and that's the end of him. We take the tablet and head into the next mission, which takes place in the ultimate dimension against Electro. Gotta focus. That magic rock's around here somewhere. And I just figured out where. If it isn't the spectacular spider smut! Oh, dude, pants! No one wants to see your junk. Keep laughing, punk! See what I found? What do you think happens if I use it? Uh, interest rates go down? Yes. It's like my powers are totally unleashed. Now I can absorb all this energy. Energy without limit! And yet, still no pants. Like with the previous levels, we'll spend most of our time pursuing Electro and fighting off the minions he conjures. We're also learning Ultimate Spider-Man's combat style during this mission, and it's pretty similar to Amazing Spider-Man. Instead of using webs though, Spider-Man utilizes the Symbiote suit, unleashing its tendrils to provide far-reaching attacks for crowd control. His combat also goes a step further, when at one point he gets overwhelmed by some heavy minions, causing him to succumb to the symbiote's aggression and enter rage mode. Spider-Man can trigger rage mode when this bar fills up, and doing so turns the screen red and allows you to weaponize the symbiote's tendrils to a greater extent. Rage mode is excellent for crowd control, and you'll often want to trigger it when you're faced with large quantities of enemies. It can also break the enemy's block, so if you have a couple annoying heavy minions, rage mode is really effective for that as well. The meter charges the more you attack, so you can prolong it if you're able to constantly fight enemies while it's triggered. I also found that building the rage meter was pretty easy, so I didn't feel like I had to save it for the biggest fights, and could instead use it frequently throughout the mission. Even though the mission structure is similar to the previous levels, there's enough difference in this one to make it stand out on its own. The level design was really well done here, and it feels more open than the prior levels. You'll have a lot more room to roam and explore, making it feel less linear. There's also some really good enemy variety, adding more depth to the combat. For example, I especially like these green laser enemies because they provide you with options on how you can deal with them. You can zip around the map to dodge the lasers and take these enemies out first, or you can use them to your advantage by guiding the lasers into other enemies, causing them to take out their own allies accidentally. It may not sound like much, but little things like that can help to keep the combat fresh. I also like that we got multiple phases of Electro boss fights too. 
We'll start with a standard battle where we dodge his blasts and beat him up until he eventually escapes and we pursue him further. We'll later catch up to him surrounded by these power generators where he's created an electric force field around himself. We'll have to wait for him to accidentally expend too much energy and depower himself, at which point we lay on the punches. As the fight progresses, he'll add in more ranged enemies that will draw our attention while he attempts to heal via the generators. I like this fight in particular because it felt like I had a lot to juggle and really had to remain aware of my surroundings. After this fight though, Electro escapes again and we chase him to the dam. He's now become even more powerful and we're left to fight giant Electro. I have become a being of pure energy without pants. Next, the city, all that power. Since we can't fight him directly, we have to use his own power against him and cause him to accidentally destroy the dam and let the water take him out. It wasn't as intricate as the previous battle against him, but I like the scale of the fight and how it forced me to think about how I could get him to destroy the environment instead of just punching him a lot. But with Electro defeated, that concludes Act 1. Mysterio was dangerous enough before when he was a simple charlatan. Imagine what he might become with even more magical might at his command. Even I can't begin to fathom it, mighty Marvelites, and that's saying something. Yes, run! Run from your master, the almighty Mysterio! No, oh, please! And for my next trick, I make two policemen disappear. Huh? More pieces of the tablet. That means more power. More. I must have them. Holy. Yeah, you said it. Even though we're now into Act 2, the goal is still the same, and that's to collect the remaining tablet pieces. We'll now return back to the Amazing Dimension, where Spider-Man finds the next piece in Sandman's possession. This level is pretty unique since we'll spend most of the time testing our traversal skills instead of combat skills. Sandman starts by turning himself into a sand tornado, destroying much of our path, so we'll have to zip around the remaining posts and even mid-air debris in order to reach him. We'll still get combat though, but with a Sandman twist. In order to hurt him, we have to douse him in water to make him dense enough to hit. Luckily, there are plenty of water barrels lying around that we can launch at him. The premise is simple enough, but I enjoyed this added layer to the combat. Sandman eventually runs off and turns himself back into a tornado, so we'll have to traverse this area and reach the water tower. You also can't web swing in this area, so you're reliant on your web zip. I really like the emphasis on traversal in this level, and it's a lot of fun using the mid-air debris as your path across. We also get a giant Sandman battle similar to Electro, where we have to trick Sandman into hitting certain things in the environment. In this case, our goal is to get him to smack these cases of water barrels so we can hit him. This isn't our last fight against Sandman though, as he heads back outside. By the time we catch up, he's formed into a massive sand tornado and his mind is split into three consciousnesses represented by these three heads. Kill him now? No! Play with him one! Don't give him a chance to escape! I want to make him suffer! Make it last! No! Do it now! Kill him! Flint, your consciousness can't handle being spread this thin. The fragment has made you too powerful. You would say that. Wait, what if he's right? No, it's a trick. It's not a trick. I can feel it. Shut up. Admit it. He's right. He's lying. Shut up. All of you, just shut up. Quiet! For this battle, we'll have to zip around using all the debris and wait for him to show one of his faces, at which point we'll find a water barrel amongst the debris and throw it at him, giving us a moment to deal some damage. This fight is pretty cool, but I did have some problems with it, mostly with the game misinterpreting my intentions. Primarily that I had a lot of issues when trying to web zip towards enemies or throw objects. They're both triggered by pressing circle, and the game often struggles to determine which one you want to do. So during this fight, I would find Sandman's face and press circle to grab a nearby barrel, but instead, Spider-Man would zip into Sandman's mouth, dealing me unnecessary damage. It happened a lot throughout the game, but it was especially evident here. I also felt like this fight took way too long and became really tedious since you're doing the same thing the whole time. Wait for the face to pop up, throw a water barrel at it, punch him, repeat. It takes some time for his face to emerge and when you do get to hit him, you don't get to deal a lot of damage. So the fight feels incredibly prolonged. Still, it's a very unique fight compared to the others in the game, focusing on traversal and web throws over straight up combat, and I appreciate that aspect. But after beating Sandman, we claim the tablet and transition back into the noir universe as we track down the vulture. 
next on my list? Osborne's right-hand monster. A sadistic circus geek who grew to love the taste of raw flesh. Like his namesake. Call him Adrian Toombs. Call him Vulture. Call him whatever you want. I'll always call him the bastard who killed my uncle. And not just killed. What's the matter, Toombs? No humans around for dinner? Can't escape me, coward! Yes, you heard that right. Vulture not only killed Uncle Ben in this universe, he also cannibalized him. In the comics, Uncle Ben was a social activist, which put him at odds with the Goblin, who eventually had him killed and then eaten by Vulture. Vulture is one of Goblin's cronies, who he recruited from a carnival freak show. In the noir comics, Goblin was also a circus freak, and he chose to recruit other circus freaks as his right-hand men. But yeah, Vulture is far more sinister in this dimension and far more terrifying, making him the one I was most nervous to fight in the game. Despite how unsettling Vulture is, though, we still have to track him down and reclaim that fragment. Like in the last Noir mission, we'll quietly pursue Vulture and take out as many of the Goblin's men as we can. On our way, we'll enter into the Creole Club, a reference to the X-Men Noir comic series. In that, the Creole Club is a casino nightclub owned by the Noir version of Remy LeBeau, aka Gambit from the classic 616 universe. Little Easter eggs like this are really fun to see in the game, and I enjoy the added world building. Inside though, Peter is approached by more of Goblin's men, leading to another combat section. After beating up these goons, we continue our search for Vulture. During our search, he jumps out at us inside this abandoned warehouse, leading to the most terrifying first-person segment in the game, since you have to stop him from trying to eat you. Once you successfully push him off, it's time for our first fight against him. He's pretty agile and will attack with his sharp claws and projectiles. There's also an added layer of verticality in this fight, as Vulture will jump to different stories of the building. It can be tough to get some hits in, so your best bet is to stun him using the spotlight scattered around the building. After doing enough damage, we knock Vulture out a window and knock ourselves out in the process. Looks like you have a train to catch, or will it catch you? After escaping the oncoming train, we track Vulture into another quiet building. Again though, he gets the drop on us and blows the building up as we enter. <laughs> wakey, wakey. Eggs and bakey. Care for a drink? Welcome to hell! Not only is the place on fire, but there also happen to be civilians inside. So we have to maneuver around the flames and find the civilians before the fire takes over. After saving the civilians, we make our way to the top of the building to escape, only to find Vulture waiting for us. The pursuit continues until we find him in an abandoned building. It seems he's decided to use the power of the tablet, which has given him the ability to teleport. This boss fight is pretty similar to the previous one with Vulture though, except now he's a lot faster and will throw molotovs at us. Our goal is to still shine spotlights on him, but it's also really enjoyable shooting web balls at him to make him drop the molotovs on himself. This fight was pretty fun, but it wasn't the most exciting in the game. I felt like I was mostly just chasing Vulture around everywhere instead of fighting in an engaging way, but I still enjoyed it overall. Now that we have another tablet piece though, we transition into the 2099 universe to face Scorpion. All public eye units in the vicinity report to 121st and Lex. One of those fragments Alchemax is looking for has been found. Units 94 and 98 en route. All units be advised. Alchemax warns that the fragment may attract freakers or other. <laughs> ah, what is that thing? Don't move! Hands where I can see them! Ah! That can't be good. Kron Stone. I didn't even like this guy when he was human. Uh-huh. Ah! He didn't say the magic word. May I please have the... Die! Don't shake your tail at me when I'm talking to you. In that cutscene, Miguel mentions that he knew Scorpion before his transformation, back when he was known as Kron Stone. In the character bio for Scorpion, it states that Kron was a high school bully and spoiled son of the president of Alchemex, Tyler Stone. Kron was turned into Scorpion one day when he was messing around with an Alchemax gene splicer and accidentally fused his DNA with a Scorpion. In the comics, Kron is also at one point Venom 2099, and I believe he's also revealed to be the half-brother of Miguel. In the game, Scorpion is hired by someone to retrieve the fragment, and in return, they promise to use it to turn him back to normal. As pitiable as Scorpion is, we have to chase him down and take the fragment back. Along the way, it seems Scorpion has been producing acidic eggs, which litter the building. 
These introduce a fun mechanic, though, where Spider-Man can throw the eggs to melt doorways, allowing access to secret locations. Even though it's fun using these eggs to your advantage by creating doorways and hitting enemies with them, they'll also often hatch mini scorpions that you have to fight. So not only are you trying to fight off public eye soldiers, but you're also juggling newly hatched scorpions. One nice thing though is that the public eye and the scorpions will often fight each other, taking some of the weight off of your shoulders. Eventually though, we'll finally catch up with Scorpion. Scorpion, I want that fragment. No! I... You don't understand the power in that thing. It's dangerous. See me. See this? I'm dangerous. Monster! But no more. She promised. She who? Who promised? Ah! Ron, listen to me! No! You listen! Smart ladies should get rock! Bring her rock! Promised! Make me human again! Human! Who? What lady? No! His first boss fight is pretty straightforward. You'll have to dodge a couple of his tail whips until he leaves himself open for some hits. He'll then jump on a wall and attempt to blast you with his tail, which produces more eggs. You'll then throw an egg at him to knock him to the ground, where you can perform a takedown. After depleting Scorpion's health bar, he'll grab us and throw us down a vent. We'll have to work our way back to him and eventually find him on top of the skyscraper. This leads to a pretty cool freefall section where the camera is below Spider-Man instead of above him this time. We'll have to dodge falling debris and if you're skilled enough, fly through hollow objects for rewards. I'm not that skilled though. It's a short segment, but I really like this inversion on the typical freefall segments we've been accustomed to. After landing, it's time for our next confrontation with Scorpion. Who is she, Kron? Who put you up to this? Shiny arms? But metal? No more talk! You got to stop me! You die. We'll learn who hired Scorpion in the next 2099 level, but for now, we have to take him down. This fight isn't much different from the previous one, just with some minor additions. The main thing we have to watch for is when Scorpion latches onto this wiring hanging from the ceiling. We knock him off by hitting him with eggs, but doing so also eats away at the platform above. After hitting Scorpion with a couple more acidic eggs, the floor will wear away, releasing a ship that falls on Scorpion. If there were any other way to help you change back, I would. But this is bigger than either of us. Congratulations, Spider-Man. You've retrieved another fragment. This day is yours. Yeah? Then how come I feel so bad about it? Moving on though, we head to the ultimate dimension and tackle potentially the most memorable level in the game. Pain Factor! With your host, the anti-hero for hire, the mask for your task, the guy who won't die, Deadpool! Hi, Ma, and welcome to Pain Factor, the only show where you compete for your life! And remember, viewers, I'm available for Black Ops missions, assassinations, and birthday parties! I don't know what's weird, that this guy can somehow come back from the dead, or that they gave him a TV show. Coming up, we've got a very special Pain Factor, with a very special guest running the gauntlet! Who? You, Spider-Man! Wait, what? That's right! Our guest today will be the one, the only, the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man! Because he needs this. Television, you are a cruel mistress. You know, you can run inside. Wow, that's not too big or anything. Can somebody say overcompensating? Spidey! Can I call you Spidey? Hey, thanks so much for being part of our little webisode. Because <laughs> cause you shoot the web. Okay, hey, can I get you anything before we start? Soda, bottled water? How about the fragment? <laughs> okay, good one. Okay, here we go. Picture up in three. And welcome, welcome, welcome to Pain Factor! Is there a mute button for him? Deadpool has convinced Spider-Man to compete on his reality show for the tablet fragment. I believe this is in reference to Ultimate Spider-Man issues 91 through 94, where Deadpool kidnaps Spider-Man and some of the X-Men and drops them on the island Krakoa, where they'll have to survive on live television. 
Spider-Man got roped into this due to his relationship with Kitty Pride, aka Shadow Cat, which is also briefly mentioned by Deadpool during this level, although it's a little tough to hear. Hey, buddy, let's talk about the question of how hot is Kitty Pride? Oh! Almost as hot as that redhead, I always seem to say that Toy Sense a bit of a love triangle there. Oh my god, I'm getting out of here. And is it true there's a clone of you out there with your brain but trapped inside a girl's body? <sighs> I think the female clone that Deadpool mentions is in reference to Ultimate Spider-Woman, who in that universe is still named Jessica Drew, but she's a female clone of Peter Parker, retaining all of his memories. As you'd expect, Deadpool is full of references and commentates throughout this whole level. One of my favorites is during a combat section where he plays an ad for psychic readings by Doctor Strange. This Doctor Strange is Stephen Strange Jr. of the Ultimate Universe, the son of Stephen Strange and Clea. It's tough to hear over the fighting, but it's another really fun reference during this level, and I love how cheesy the ad is. There is a world of spirits, unseen by most, but just as real as our own. And when you need a guy to penetrate his mystery, you know him. <laughs> Doctor Strange, yeah, yeah, Stephen Strange Jr. A man who is who has cheated death itself is now available for sight The level itself is really fun too. For the most part, we can free roam this island and it's pretty large compared to the other levels. Our goal is to swing around the island and destroy each of Deadpool's cameras. We'll also be fighting Deadpool's minions in the game, who happen to be his fanboys dressed in his Deadpool merch. Hey man, love your outfit. Back at ya! You get yours from the fan club catalog too? Nah, the gift shop. You know, if you get it in person, they actually tailor it for you. No way! Right there in the shop? Yeah, well, I mean, they take your measurements there in the shop, but doing the actual tailoring takes a couple days, but it's so worth it. Yeah, I was gonna say! I mean, right? Dude, 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 turn around. Let me look at how it fits ya. Yeah, I gotta say, that is really nice. But after destroying all of Deadpool's cameras, he'll take matters into his own hands. And in person, the one, the only, Deadpool! Oh, look at you. What about me? Yeah, I thought you'd be taller. I... Oh, well, we just won't use a lot of wide lenses. Deadpool! Thank you, thank you. Don't throw flowers, just send money. Don't take this the wrong way, but you seem a couple peas short of a pot. This boss fight is pretty much what you'd expect. Deadpool is a weapons expert, so he'll use sword and gun attacks until he has to answer a phone call and teleports away. While he's distracted, we can sneak up on him and perform a takedown. After depleting his health bar, he'll run away and will continue the gauntlet by smashing more cameras. To change up the pace a bit, we eventually reach a challenge where we have to race across these pipes before a tidal wave crashes into us. It doesn't sound like much, but it's an exciting section that ends with you zipping across a ship before it crashes. It's not too hard, but it's really cool visually. After safely avoiding the waves, we're brought to the finale of the level, a cage match against Deadpool enhanced with the tablet. The tablet produces two Deadpool clones, so we'll have to fight three versions of Deadpool at once, each one with a different specialization. One focuses on sword combat, one has dual pistols, and the last one throws grenades. That last one will also wait in the back while you fight the other Deadpools for an opportunity to grab you. Quick question, boxes or briefs? This fight wasn't too complex, but it was really fun and thematic. And after taking out all three Deadpools, we claim the fragment and end act two. So far, so good! Our web-slingers have triumphed over unbelievable odds. But there are still more pieces of that terrifying tablet out there. And something tells me the worst is yet to come. And voila! Excellent work, Spider-Man. Who says good help is hard to find? Now, just one more fragment to go, and look out! The rest of the tablet will be mine. It must be mine. You again? Why don't you go saw a lady in half or something? Hey, that was no illusion. You've underestimated me for the last time, Spider-Man. And this old crone will pay for your insolence. Recover the rest of the tablet for me, or this will be the last you see of her. Ah! Stop. I'll do it. Just don't hurt her, okay? Hurry, spider. The clock's ticking. <laughs> to start Act 3, we'll return to the Amazing Dimension against an unexpected villain. Oh, well, this is a little too easy. Why did I say that? Out of my way! 
juggernaut. Yeesh, could things get any worse? Die. Did it again, didn't I? Give up, juggernaut. Silver sable's on your tail. Get lost! <laughs> Not a chance, Marco. My wild pack can track your every move. And for the bounty that's on your head, we follow you to the ends of the earth. I think I'll just let them play through. All I care about right now is that frag... Oh, come on! Juggy must have picked it up somehow, and he's probably too stupid to even realize it. Can't let Sable take him in before I get that fragment. All right, Spidey, think. Sable said something about tracking him. Ah. This will buy me a little alone time with Juggy. All units! Juggernaut is moving fast to the east! Don't let him get away! Great! Now it's just him and me. You! Great, now it's just him and me. I wasn't expecting to see Juggernaut in this game, but I'm so glad that they included him. While in motion, Juggernaut is an immovable object, so you can't damage him while he's moving. You'll have to wait for him to stop running, or until he does a ground smash which leaves him vulnerable. It's never that easy to take him down though, as he decides to throw us a good distance away to make his escape. To make things worse, Silver Sable returns and spots us. Apparently, Spider-Man has a bounty on his head too, so she's designated us as another target for her men to capture. Sable is more concerned with Juggernaut though, leaving us to deal with her men. After clearing through them, we continue to follow Juggernaut, but he's proving difficult to keep track of. I got something for you. Jeez, not often you see a guy pick a fight with a building and win. We continue to follow Juggernaut as he makes his way up the under construction Oscorp building. When we reach the top, we have an up close brawl with Juggernaut as we attempt to remove his helmet. We're successful, making him much more vulnerable to damage. He's still not down for the count though, so we have to take him out Hulk style like in Avengers Age of Ultron. This is gonna be a bumpy ride. be a miracle if either of them survived that. This game came out first though, so I wonder if Avengers copied that from Shattered Dimensions. Nevertheless, Juggernaut is still conscious and even worse, he's activated the power of the tablet, leading to our final showdown with him. Lucky for us though, Madam Web informs us that the power of the tablet seems to be conflicting with Juggernaut's Crimson Gem of Sidorak, which is what gives him his unstoppable powers. This means he's not quite as overpowered as he thinks he is, and we're able to catch him off guard. Occasionally, he'll cause so much destruction that the room fills with dust, allowing us to sneak up on him and web him up for a powerful throw. Like in the previous battle with him, if he's not moving, we can deal damage to him, so this fight isn't too overwhelming. After enough damage, we take him down and reclaim the tablet. Continuing on, we now switch into the Noir Dimension. The old carnival. Osborne's camped out here somewhere in this rotted alley of nightmares. But I'll find him. Him and the fragments he's collected. He's after those rocks we've been bringing you. First, he got Bolcha and Hammerhead, and now he's headed here. I'm telling you, Mr. Osborne, the Spider-Man is coming. Do you take me for a fool? <laughs> what? what? I want him to come. Let the spider fall into my web. The other fragments made Hammerhead and Vulture more powerful. Let's see what this one does for me. I've waited a long time for this, Osborne. Tonight, your criminal empire ends. In the noir comics, Norman looks like his normal self until it's revealed that he's been wearing a mask this whole time and his true skin is green and scaly, which is why he was in a freak show and earned the name Goblin. He's not as giant and imposing in the comics as he is here in the game though. Instead, it's the tablet that gives him his massive size. Norman also reveals that this is the carnival that he was held in. He's decided to round up all the current employees and cage them, so it's up to us to free them from Goblin's men. I also want to say that I absolutely love the level design here. This is easily one of my favorite levels in the game, purely based on a visual aspect. Maybe I'm just a sucker for creepy carnival atmosphere, but I really love the lighting, the fireworks, and especially the demented carousel music that plays in the background throughout the level. He's 
I also love that the fireworks serve a gameplay purpose. Since your goal as Spider-Man Noir is to stick to the shadows, the fireworks are a big disadvantage for you. You now have to try and anticipate when the fireworks will go off so as to not accidentally get caught out in the open by the enemies. It can be frustrating and test your patience if you're getting caught a lot from it, but I really like this added layer of environmental awareness it forced me to have. Aside from that though, the level functions relatively the same as the other Noir levels. We'll sneak around and web up henchmen while saving civilians as we pursue the main villain. The level is much bigger this time around though, and the design is so incredible that I don't mind the repetition, and this is definitely the most engaging noir level in the game. But after rescuing all the captured civilians, it's time to continue towards Goblin by going through this creepy clown door. Did all hope, ye who enter here. You make it sound so in ah! Behold! The Goblin in all his glory. Stronger. More powerful! And that hair, it's scarier than ever. I'll give you something to be scared of. Our first person fight segment starts with Norman attempting to stomp out our crotch, I'm really glad I dodged that one, and we'll wail on him until he finally slams us to the ground. Instead of attempting to pummel us though, he flees and taunts us to follow. We eventually follow him into this fun house where we have to pick the correct door to progress. I'll be honest, I have no idea how you're supposed to know which door to choose, and I pretty much got it based on blind luck. Although I think you're maybe supposed to pick the door with the twitchiest clown, but I don't know for sure. Regardless, the correct door leads to a twisty hallway, originally part of some kind of ride. We'll make our way through a couple more strange rooms until we're confronted by Norman again, who throws us down a chute that takes us outside. From here, we finally confront Goblin. Are you gonna stand there babbling all night, or are we gonna end this? That's me. He's too strong to fight head on, so we have to dodge around and target the weak point on his back. Occasionally, the lights will go out, giving us an opportunity to sneak up behind him for a takedown. After doing this a couple more times, we take him out. Back to the freak show. Oh, boo hoo. Next up is Spider Man 2099 as he infiltrates the Alchemex building. Preliminary tests confirm what I've suspected from the beginning, that this artifact is an energy source of almost immeasurable power. Clearly, this calls for proactive measures to prevent it from falling into the hands of... Rivals! Go, oh, man! Busted! So, we finally meet. I'm Serena Patel, head of Alchemax's Shadow Division. Never heard of it. Yes, that's why it's called Shadow Division. Ah, touche. So, what's the master plan, Patel? You shadowy types always have one. Hmm, I could kill you, or I could explain everything and then kill you. I think I'll just kill you. Son of a... If you've seen Into the Spider-Verse, you'll recall that there was a female Dr. Octopus in that movie as well. These two are different though, as the movie version is named Olivia Octavius, while the game's version is Serena Patel both of which are original characters and not seen in the comics. There is a female Dr. Octopus in the comics though, nicknamed Lady Octopus, although she's also a different version named Carolyn Trainer. So there have been a few different female versions of Dr. Octopus before, but none of them are related to each other. Still, it's a neat parallel that Shattered Dimensions and Into the Spider-Verse both feature a female Dr. Octopus. This version is equally nefarious too, as she's the one responsible for hiring Scorpion to retrieve the tablet for her. It's also suggested that she was the one who created the 2099 Hobgoblin. Our first order of business against her though is to shut down her condensed matter reactor. To do so, we'll have to unplug each of the four cables. Along the way, Patel uses a giant mechanical arm to try and crush us. If we time it right, we can get the arm to smash into one of these three lights, causing it to short circuit. Ock flees, but she'll return a little bit later in another mechanical arm. We'll do the same thing again, causing her to flee back to the reactor. We'll continue shutting down these cables, and we'll also get another fun reference. I've been working here for years, and I still can't believe that Alkanax just flat out ripped off the Avengers logo. After shutting down the power to the reactor, we go back up there to confront Ock. This leads to our next fight against her, where she's protected by a force field. To shut it down, we'll have to pull these batteries out while dodging her lasers. She's not totally vulnerable yet though, since she still has access to a lot of energy. Eventually, she'll send out a large energy blast, giving us a second to perform a takedown. We'll do this a couple more times until she powers up even more. She'll send some of her robotic minions our way, but after you defeat one, it releases an explosive core that we can throw at Ock to incapacitate her. With the tablet fragment in hand, we now head to the Ultimate Universe for our final level of Act 3. Ock 
great, just great. I figure why not swing by the Triskelion and see if I could get some help from Nick Fury or any of his S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. And this is what I find. Either something really big happened here, or Nick Fury has terrible taste in decoration. Red goop, the bodies drained to husks. There's only one thing that could do this. One thing. In the Ultimate Universe, Carnage is created by Dr. Kurt Connors after mixing Peter Parker's blood with a sample of the Venom symbiote. It survives by draining the life out of people, as we can see with these poor S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. Apparently, Spider-Man thought he had previously destroyed Carnage in the past with S.H.I.E.L.D.'s help, but unbeknownst to Peter, it seems S.H.I.E.L.D. has been conducting secret experiments on Carnage using the tablet fragment. Those experiments have clearly backfired, and Carnage now has the fragment. This level is really spooky, especially when Carnage uses the fragment to puppet the dead S.H.I.E.L.D. soldiers, essentially turning them into zombies. They'll be the main minions we fight throughout the level, but we'll also come across some S.H.I.E.L.D. spider slayers who mistake us for the enemy based on our symbiote suit. This level is a lot of fun, and we often encounter large volumes of enemies, making Rage Mode incredibly enjoyable. To add to the chaos though, we eventually come across shield cells full of Carnage clones, so we'll now have to face these alongside the other enemy types. There's also another really cool easter egg hidden here. Inside the shield prison is a cell containing Deadpool and Electro. Eventually, we find Carnage outside amidst the rubble of a crashed helicarrier. We'll start the battle with a first-person slugfest and then throw Carnage into one of the reactors. The symbiote is vulnerable to heat, so these explosions do some nice damage. This could also be a reference to how Peter defeated Carnage the first time, which was by throwing him into an industrial chimney. We'll do this multiple times during the fight, as Carnage will often perch up on one of the reactors, making it easy to kick him into it. It's a pretty cool boss fight too, and it's fun using our symbiote powers against his. It's a pretty simple fight though, and after beating him, he'll run off. This leads to a really cool escape section, where we have to run away as fast as possible as a helicarrier is crashing right towards us. I love when the game inserts these little escape scenes. They're usually short, but they're really tense and exciting, with this one being amongst my favorites. We continue chasing Carnage to the top of the tower, where we find a symbiote egg sac and some more spider slayers. Luckily, S.H.I.E.L.D. has wised up and informed the slayers that we're an ally, so they'll assist us during this fight now. We'll also get another cool reference as Spider-Man decides to name one of the robots. Well, what do you know? My very own robot sidekicks. I'll call this one Herbie. Herbie is the name of the robot assistant of the Fantastic Four, a team that Spider-Man is really close to in the comics. But anyway, the fight is on and we start by helping these slayers destroy the egg sac. Once we do, we find Carnage inside and continue to duke it out. After a while, he'll reform the egg sac, meaning that we have to destroy it again. We're also faced with an influx of Carnage minions, so we'll have to defend the Spider Slayers as they attempt to burn the egg. We'll continue this process a couple times until we finally defeat Carnage. This also ends Act 3, which leads us into the climax of the game. Hey, not bad, webheads. They fought their way from one dimension to the next, faced a number of their most fearsome foes, and found the final fragments of the fabled Tablet of Order and Chaos. But they're not done yet. Remember, there's still a damsel in distress, so what are you waiting for, heroes? Hop to it! What now? I can't give the final tablet piece to Mysterio, but if I don't, it's lights out for Madam Web. Think, Spidey, think. After years of pretending, of faking my way with special effects and stage magic, to have a taste of the real thing. <sighs> I can't wait any longer. Where is he? I want that tablet! Don't say I never gave you anything. The tablet, it's reassembling itself. Oh, great. Power! Beyond that of a god, the walls of reality crumble before me! Madam Web, don't worry about me, Spider-Man. Look! The web of reality, the tapestry of the universe, is unraveling. Yes, a universe to remake in my image. 
I will devour every dimension until all is Mysterio! Last chance. With the walls of reality broken, I can summon your counterparts from the other worlds. The four of you, together, are reality's only hope. With Mysterio wielding the complete tablet, each dimension will have to work together to defeat him. We'll start with Noir Spider-Man first, and this is the point that it becomes glaringly obvious that Beanox ripped off ideas from Batman Arkham Asylum, because this is clearly a copy of the Scarecrow levels from that game. I guess if you're going to copy something from a game though, you might as well pull from one of the best. And it does fit nicely with the Spider-Man Noir character, since your goal is to hide in the shadows to avoid Mysterio's gaze. If he catches you, he'll fire off incredibly damaging blasts, leaving little margin for error. There's not much to it though, and it's basically red light, green light. You'll slowly make your way up to him until you're close enough to perform a web attack. This section wasn't too exciting though, and I still think Arkham did it better. Next up though is Ultimate Spider-Man, who basically has to fend off all of the demons that Mysterio conjures. Occasionally, Mysterio will send out these orbs that release another demon, and when they do, you can destroy them, sending a damaging shockwave at Mysterio. It's a pretty simple section, but Ultimate Spider-Man's combat is so enjoyable to use that this segment ended up being really fun. We then transition into Spider-Man 2099, whose section is focused on his freefall gameplay. You'll have to dodge debris and Mysterio's magic to catch up to him. You'll also have to utilize your boost and accelerated vision pretty frequently or else Mysterio will outpace you. This was happening to me, and it felt like this section was never ending. I think I'm also just really bad at these freefall segments, so take that for what you will, but I found it to be the most challenging section of this Mysterio fight. Still, I wouldn't say it was a lot of fun and was probably slightly more enjoyable than Noir's section. But after catching up to Mysterio, we then transition into our final dimension, Amazing Spider-Man. This one was my favorite and a good way to end the game. You'll start by landing on one of these platforms before you're swarmed by creatures. You'll have to take all of them out, and it's a little bit trickier when you don't have a rage mode to rely on. Amazing Spider-Man has good area of effect web attacks though, so you're still equipped to handle the onslaught. After clearing through them, you'll web kick a piece of debris at Mysterio's helmet. You'll follow this pattern multiple times, and I found it to be really challenging just based on the sheer quantity of enemies that swarm you. I like this challenge though, and it felt like I barely beat the boss at the end, which felt rewarding. A lesson to all you wannabe bad guys out there. When destroying dimensions and defying do-gooders, watch out. Because you might unleash forces beyond your control. Like the palpable power of four sensational Spider-Men. Wait! Wait, the tablet! Oh, it could still be mine! It could still... Some guys never learn. And, uh, speaking of learning, you should learn how to count. Something tells me you're outnumbered. <laughs> Gentlemen. I really hate this fella. <laughs> ah, come on! He's a blast to kick <laughs> in the face! Pal, you got... <laughs> Shut The walls of reality are rebuilding themselves. And now, you must all return to your own dimensions. See you later, older and less cool versions of me. Old? Hey, I'm from the future. To me, all you guys are ancient history. Good to know there is a future, and men like you to carry on the good fight. Word. <laughs> Bye, guys. Next time you should hang around longer. We could start a bridge club or something. Come on, Misty. Time to drop you off at Supervillain Daycare. Thank you, Spider-Man. You should be proud to know your legacy is being upheld across time and space. Yeah, those guys were all right, but you have to admit. With four different Spider-Men? The one thing I know for sure? Out of all of them? I'm the best! And so ends one of the most titanic team-ups of all time. And what have we learned here today, Marvelites? That no matter what corner of the cosmos you may find yourself in, there'll always be a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man to save the day. And to all of you web-spinning wonders, I proudly say, Excelsior! The credits are pretty cool too, as we get glimpses at what happened to each of the villains after we beat them. For example, it looks like there's now an army of hobgoblins. Sandman is stuck in an hourglass. Vulture's return to being part of the Circus Freak Show, along with Goblin who is handing out balloons there. Deadpool is stranded on a deserted island, and there's this creepy one of Carnage hanging out with the zombie shield agents. It's a pretty cool credits montage overall, plus we get one final end credit scene. Oh, so, <laughs> what I miss? What the? 
Nuff said, kids. Nuff said. So that ends the story of Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions. Overall, I think it was a really fun journey. In concept, the story is very simple though. Even though the game took me around 10 hours to complete, a lot of the missions are just filler for the story, requiring us to collect tablets from various bosses, while the main plot only progresses at the end of each act as we follow Mysterio. That being said, I don't think it's a problem in this game, since the writing for each character is so good and all the different locations are so fun to visit. The story is mostly there to take us from place to place, while the level design and gameplay are the real standouts. So let's start to dive into those more next. This new spider sense is a trip! Either I'm not used to it yet, or I'm sensing one of the fragments closing in on me? Nope, I was right. Well, at least I found it. Ah, uh, 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 Spider, don't fade on me yet. What are you supposed to be? A demonic kumquat? You can call me the Hobgoblin! Every Spider-Man needs one. Newsflash, Hobby. You're not my first goblin. Ah, but this goblin has one thing the others never had. The fragment! Yes, and with its power, I'm going to tear this world apart! <laughs> We've talked about the combat of each character a good bit already, so I won't dwell on it for too long here, but overall, I think it's pretty solid. If I had to choose my favorite dimension in the game, I think I'd say that Amazing and Ultimate were my favorites to play as, mostly due to their effectiveness against large groups of enemies. Amazing's web attacks feel like they have a satisfying weight to them, and they're visually enjoyable to watch. Ultimate Spider-Man has the added bonus of the Rage Meter, which I think made him the most fun to use. His normal attacks feel effective on their own, but triggering Rage Mode really turned the dial to 11 in terms of damage output. It was also really fun trying to juggle that rage meter once activated, postponing its depletion and taking out extra enemies in the process. Spider-Man 2099 was really cool too, but I didn't have as much fun with his combat compared to the others. Although he does have my favorite charge ability in the game, where he can zip around and damage multiple enemies in the blink of an eye. That leaves Spider-Man Noir, but he's not really a combat character, since so much of his gameplay is based around stealth. His combat sections were pretty fun when they appeared though. He's not doing anything flashy with his moves, but he feels like an old-school brawler. The enemies you'll deal with fit that theme too, since you're typically scrapping with Goblin's cronies and not some super-powered creature. So even though his combat was pretty basic, I enjoyed it more because it fit the setting. I have trouble deciding how I feel about Noir's stealth gameplay though. On the one hand, I really like how unique it is compared to the rest of the game. Instead of focusing on combat like the other dimensions, I like that the Noir levels slow down the pace and have you approach enemies in a different way. It often felt like a puzzle where you're trying to figure out which enemies to take down first as you work your way to the last one. However, that enjoyment started to wane the longer I was in the level. There are some really cool takedown animations and it's satisfying to clear a room, but it can start to feel redundant after a while. Stealth sections in games are always tricky though, and even games like Arkham and Spider-Man PS4 have struggled to make them shine, so I don't want to diss the noir levels too much, but I felt like they were the weakest gameplay sections compared to the rest of the dimensions. I want to emphasize that I don't think they're bad missions, just that I think I enjoyed the other dimensions a bit more from a gameplay perspective. As far as what I think could have made these stealth sections more enjoyable, I think I would have liked more options. In these stealth sections, you're primarily trying to position yourself around a henchman for a takedown while staying in the shadows. If you're caught, your only viable option is to run and hide and wait for them to reset before trying again. One thing I would have liked is to be able to effectively fight enemies that have spotted you. In this game, you can try, but they block your hits and you'll struggle to damage them quickly. This is surely intentional in hopes of dissuading the player from trying to drop down and fight all the enemies. However, I would have liked combat to be more viable. In the Arkham games, you're trying to clear the room stealthily as well, but if you're caught, you're now faced with a decision. Can you take down the henchman quickly before his buddies run over to overwhelm you, or do you run and hope he doesn't shoot you in the back? It may not sound like much, but trying to make these quick decisions on the fly and cover your tracks was a fun element in Arkham Asylum, and I think it would have been fun here too. I understand why Beanox chose not to do it, but I felt like it left me with less options for how to handle these enemies. I think interacting with the environment would have been helpful too. In Spider-Man PS4 and Arkham, you'll have methods for setting traps for enemies in the environment, as well as ways to distract guards and lure them around. Spider-Man Noir isn't the type of hero to carry around gadgets, so I'm not suggesting that he have a lot of tech, but I think something as simple as being able to shoot a web bullet to a specific spot to lure a guard there would have been nice. If I remember correctly, you can't even take down enemies that are on alert, you have to wait for them to completely cool down and sneak up on them. My point is, I didn't feel like I had a lot of control over how I could take down enemies, besides where I positioned Spider-Man. So having additional options would have added some variety and made me feel more strategic. 
But like I said, I still enjoyed these stealth levels, I just think there are ways they could have added more depth to them. However, I think the Noir Dimension was my favorite one to visit compared to the others. I absolutely love the 1930s aesthetic and how perfectly Beanox nailed the atmosphere. Each dimension is unique, but Noirs felt the most separate from the others in the best of ways. Where the other dimensions were brighter and full of jokes, Noir was dark and serious. The way everyone talked and interacted felt different, and Peter's motivations felt a lot more personal and vengeful. The other versions of Spider-Man were just tracking down a tablet fragment, but Spider-Man Noir had a bone to pick with these enemies, and the tablet was a good excuse to finally handle them. These were the people that killed his Uncle Ben after all. All of these elements together made Noir really stand out, and I was always excited to start one of his levels just for the sheer enjoyment of being immersed in his world again. Not to mention that Carnival level was such a standout in the game, and probably the most memorable one for me. The level design in general for this game is a big area where Beanox excelled. You can tell a lot of time went into crafting each level and making it feel unique from the others. For example, the Amazing Dimension is meant to look similar to the classic comics, so they added this filter which gives it that grainier look. Ultimate feels a lot more vibrant and modern, while 2099 is obviously very futuristic. It's exciting exploring all of these worlds, and each one stands out in its own way. As you get further into the game, the levels start to open up more with bigger areas and more verticality, incentivizing you to explore. I was happy to do so because I was enjoying every detail each level had to offer. Shattered Dimensions also has a ton of style and creativity. Levels can go from feeling pretty straightforward to suddenly becoming more cinematic and alter how you're playing. For example, that sniper rifle perspective in the Craven level, or that inverted perspective when you're free falling as 2099. Even though these segments were often short, they went a long way into spicing up the gameplay and making it more thrilling. I think the first person combat falls under this category too, and I felt like it was a really cool inclusion. It's more immersive and intimidating to be face to face with a villain like that, and I think it was a really creative idea. These aren't the only moments you'll go into first person mode either, as some of the cutscenes will temporarily put you in a first person perspective as well. I enjoyed this a lot, and it was fun being put in Spider-Man's shoes for a moment, especially when you get to experience it while web-swinging. So much of this game exudes creativity, from the level design, to the combat, to the cinematics. Beanox was truly coming up with some brilliant features. Even though I kind of knocked them for taking aspects of Arkham Asylum for the noir sections, that's really such a small part of the game, and it shouldn't overshadow all of the inventive ideas that they've had throughout it. I also think they did a great job at balancing all of these different gameplay moments within each level. For example, the first person combat is usually pretty short and is slotted into boss fights as a way to add some flavor. We also talked about how combat sections were put in between stealth missions and the noir levels to break those up, or the traversal challenge during the Deadpool level after fighting off tons of enemies. These little segments help to break up any redundancy that you may be feeling, and I think it balances out the gameplay. I also like how Spider-Man's attacks are handled for each dimension. Beanox chose to keep things simple and have each Spider-Man follow the same button inputs for attacks, but each Spider-Man has their own unique visual animation associated with it. For example, you can unlock an area of effect ability triggered by pressing triangle and circle at the same time. For Spider-Man 2099, he'll perform a whirlwind kick, while Amazing Spider-Man will spin two web cannonballs around him. I like the simplicity of the combat in the game, and it makes it easier to keep track of each Spider-Man's specific moveset. We should also talk about the upgrade menu in the game. There are two specific ones, combat upgrades and character upgrades. Character upgrades give you things like increased health, increased rage meter duration, and new costumes which we'll discuss shortly. Then there's combat upgrades where you can buy new attacks and combos. That part is pretty standard, but what's interesting is how it's broken up. You'll reveal unlockable abilities as you complete different challenges. There are 180 total challenges in the game, and after accomplishing a certain number of them, you'll reveal a new series of upgrades. Each level has its own set of challenges, and you can visit the Web of Destiny menu to determine what still needs to be done. Examples of challenges are things like hitting 5 public eye officers with benches, find 90 spider emblems in a level, or zip over 5 objects thrown by Juggernaut. The more you can complete, the more upgrades you'll have available in the game. I think this is a cool idea though, and I haven't seen it in another game before. Another reason I liked it was because it incentivized me to pay attention to challenges and play in a way that I may not have otherwise. It also gave me some additional replay value as you try to play through levels again to complete more challenges. If you can complete all 180, you'll be able to unlock the last four outfits in the game. They're arguably the four best ones too, specifically Scarlet Spider, Iron Spider, and the Negative Zone Suit, all of which you can enter cheat codes for if you don't have the skill or patience to get all 180 challenges, like me. There is one final outfit, but I think its cheat code is bugged, so all I have is a screenshot of it, which is the Mangaverse suit. There was also a DLC suit pack that I wasn't able to access, which gives you four cosmic Spider-Man outfits. There are plenty of other cool outfits in the game too though, such as the Bombastic Bagman, the Electro-Proof suit, 
Flipside, and the original concept for the Spider-Man Noir suit. Lastly, we have the Secret War suit, Ultimate Spider-Man, Spider-Armor, and Spider-Man 1602. All of these look incredible, and I love that they even included little bios about each suit if you're curious about its origin. There are other unlockables as well, based on the difficulty at which you beat the level. Beating a level unlocks character bios, and beating it on normal unlocks various concept arts for you to check out. If you beat a level on hard, you unlock figurines that you can examine in detail. The unlockables were pretty cool in this game, and I like that they add some replay value as well. Gotta hurry up and find the next fragment. And there it is. So why is my spider sense tingling? Jeez, talk about a dirt nap. Where's that guy? Looking for this, webhead? Well, if it ain't my old pal, Flint Marco, the Sandman. You know, every time we play together, I end up digging sand out of my costume for weeks. I got a game for you to play. Marco? Marco? Polo! Oh man, I thought my jokes were bad. Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions is full of noteworthy voice actors, all of which give a phenomenal performance in the game. I won't go over all of them, but there are some that I want to call out specifically. We'll start with our various Spider-Men, whose actors have all voiced the character before in different animated shows. First, we have Neil Patrick Harris playing Amazing Spider-Man. He's probably best known as Barney Stinson from How I Met Your Mother, but he's also voiced Spider-Man once before in the short-lived Spider-Man The New Animated series. It only lasted one season, but I'm sure it's what got him the role, and I actually like his Peter Parker a lot in the game. There's also Christopher Daniel Barnes, best known for voicing Spider-Man in the 90s animated show. This was the Spider-Man that I grew up with, and I was really happy to hear him voicing Peter again. In the game, he's voicing the noir version of Spider-Man. We also have Josh Keaton in the game, voicing Ultimate Spider-Man. Prior to the game, Josh voiced Peter in the Spectacular Spider-Man animated series, and he's also played Harry Osborn in the first two Spider-Man movie games. Lastly, we have Dan Gilvezon voicing Spider-Man 2099. Dan's time as Spider-Man began in the 80s, where he voiced Peter in Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends. I love that Beanox decided to hire these specific actors to reprise their roles, since I think it shows a lot of respect for the iterations that came before, and I'm sure fans appreciate seeing the Spider-Man that they grew up with represented in the voice cast. After the game's release, Marvel also released a vignette of these different actors describing their roles. I'm the amazing Spider-Man of the four in the game, and so I have uh, the lion's share of all of the dialogue, which is fun, because he's the more sarcastic of them. I'm Dan Gilvezan, performing the role of Spider-Man 2099. I was thrilled to hear that they were going to use some of the older voices, because these are the voices that the fans really know and appreciate. I think we recorded 25 different variations for when something happens, so when Spider-Man beats a boss, he can say, and that's that, or he can say, Who's having a good time? Raise your hand. So I think the more you play it, the different stuff will happen. My name is Josh Keaton, and I play Ultimate Spider-Man. I think the thing that I relate to most about Peter Parker is the fact that he leads a double life. Because when I was in high school, I was a total dork. But on the other side, I had a whole different group of friends. He's kind of the trash talker of, of the Marvel heroes. I think that that's going to be something people look for. People want to have that attitude. I'm Christopher Daniel Barnes, and I'm playing Spider-Man Noir. It's a blast. It's a lot of fun. It's creative and to see that there's really sort of a, an overwhelmingly positive response to what you've done, that's just a great feeling. Get your tissues ready because the next voice actor I want to highlight is none other than Stan Lee, the narrator of the game. He does an excellent job and really brings that enthusiasm and charisma that we all love him for. Marvel also released an interview with him about the game, so I'll play some snippets of that. The fact that I had something to do with his origin and that today He's one of the world's most recognizable and popular superheroes. Well, as you can imagine, it, it's a great feeling. I've been asked what, what aspects of my character do I see in Spider-Man, and I would say his courage, his nobility, his sense of always doing the right thing. I would say the greatness in that man in some way reminds me of me. Spider-Man has had so many different villains, supervillains. I think one of my favorites has been Craven the Hunter. 
because he's a little bit different than most other villains. And there's even something likable about him, even though he's a villain. I think probably one of the reasons for Spider-Man's enduring popularity is the fact that he's probably the most human of all the superheroes. He has these personal problems, which makes it easy for an audience to relate to him. Spider-Man is sort of the superhero who could be you. Along with Stan and our Spider-Men are some other noteworthy members of the cast. We'll begin with John Kassir, who voices Scorpion in this game. We talked about John a lot in the X-Men Legends 2 retrospective since he was the first person to voice Deadpool. John voiced Deadpool from X-Men Legends 2 through Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2 until this game where he passes the torch to Nolan North. Nolan North is easily one of the biggest names in voice acting right now, and he's one of those voice actors who just seems like he's in everything. He's probably best known as Nathan Drake in the Uncharted series, and more recently as Iron Man in Marvel's Avengers. After voicing Deadpool in Shattered Dimensions, Nolan went on to voice him in the Deadpool solo game, as well as Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3. I think Nolan does a good job as Deadpool here, and his comedic timing and zany delivery matches the Merc with the Mouth very well. Another actor who seems to be in everything is Steve Bloom, who we've discussed in every retrospective on this channel so far. It's no surprise either, because he's an extremely talented voice actor, always bringing his characters to life. The same goes for Shattered Dimensions, where he's voicing Hobgoblin and Vulture. Another actor who we've seen a couple times before in these retrospectives is David Kay, most recently voicing Wolverine and Iron Man in Marvel Nemesis. In Shattered Dimensions, he's the voice of our main antagonist, Mysterio. We also have Tara Strong voicing Dr. Octopus 2099, and she's probably a familiar name to DC fans based on her time also voicing Harley Quinn. Lastly is Jennifer Hale voicing Silver Sable. This isn't her first time playing Sable either, since she's reprising her role after playing her in both the Ultimate Spider-Man game and Spider-Man Friend or Foe. You may also know her as the actress who played Black Cat in the 90s Spider-Man animated series. There are plenty of other talented voice actors that I didn't include in this list, so it's no surprise that the voice acting is so well done in the game, and I have no complaints on that front. Continuing on though, let's talk about the music. There are a lot of great tracks in the game, but I've picked out four of my favorites, one from each dimension. We'll start with this track from one of the noir levels, and I think it captures that old-timey feel perfectly for the game. Next up is one from the 2099 levels, and I think it captures the fast-paced, futuristic feeling of the 2099 dimension. For the Amazing Universe, I really like this track that plays during the Craven level, since the choir makes it feel a lot more tense and epic.
And lastly is the track that plays during the Electro level in the Ultimate Universe. This one was probably my favorite for its quick tempo and how at moments, it evokes a feeling of impending doom. Overall, I think the audio was really well done for both the voice acting and the music. The voice actors fit their roles perfectly, and it was really cool seeing different actors reprise their previous roles. The music set the mood for each level and elevated the atmosphere, so I think the audio was really top-notch in Shattered Dimensions. Well, what do you know? I swing around long enough, and my new upgraded spider sense points me towards a fragment. Definitely sensing something from inside the, uh, jungle room? Look at that! If it isn't Mr. Tablet Fragment, right there, waiting for me to grab it. Which can only mean one thing. It's... Oh! Trapped! Gotcha! That wasn't so bad, actually. Oh, come on! Rest now, my brain. Sailor strength. For when you awake, we begin the hunt. <laughs> This was my first time playing Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions, and I'm really mad at myself for not trying it back in 2010. I think I had felt burned by games like Spider-Man 3 and Friend or Foe at the time, and just assumed Shattered Dimensions was another Spider-Man cash grab. I was so wrong though. This game was incredibly fun to play, even now over a decade after its initial release. I think what really elevates this game though is its level design. Each dimension has its own unique flair, and there wasn't one that I didn't enjoy visiting. The levels do a great job immersing you into that world, and I think there are some great creative touches injected into each level that make it all the better. For example, those first-person fighting segments, and the moments where you have to act fast to either escape a crashing helicarrier, or save a civilian from a rampaging ferris wheel. There are a ton of creative ideas in the game, and it's a really fun experience. Even though I had some criticisms for the game, primarily in the noir levels, they were really minor in the grand scheme of things. I love this game and I'd definitely replay it, and I'd recommend it to anyone who's thinking of either revisiting it or playing it for the first time. But like always, I want to see how the game fared on Metacritic and compare it to my thoughts. Currently, critic scores are at a 74, and user scores at 77. I was actually surprised at how low these scores were, since I felt it deserved much higher. I personally give Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions an 8.5 out of 10, and I think it's an outstanding game that anyone could enjoy, and it's a really fun journey through different Spider-Man universes. It's especially interesting in retrospect, knowing that this was the original Spider-Verse of sorts, inspiring future comic stories, which in turn inspired the Into the Spider-Verse movie. So yeah, excellent game, and I had a blast playing through it for this video. But those are my thoughts on Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions. For the next video, we'll keep talking Spider-Man in anticipation of the Spider-Man No Way Home movie coming out. With returning characters from prior Spider-Man movie universes, I think it's a great time to revisit what's considered to be one of the best superhero games of its time, and possibly one of the best superhero games ever made, Spider-Man 2. I absolutely loved this game as a kid, and I'm really excited to revisit it to see how it's held up over the years. So that's what's coming up next, and in the meantime though, if you're interested in more retrospectives, I have plenty of others that you can check out like The Punisher, Marvel Nemesis, and the Marvel Ultimate Alliance series. If you'd like to discuss all things Marvel with other fans, you can join us on Discord, the link is in the description below. But anyway, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.